Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. I'm thrilled to be here. It's an absolute pleasure and honor. Read Andy's book, From the Ashes of Angels, Gods of Eden, back in 1997 at Laura Lee's house in Seattle. Okay, so let's, uh, let's press on. I think we've got that worked out. We're going to be talking about the lost spiritual technology of angels. And I've been asked to focus on the, the watchers of the Enochian tradition as light beings. We probably are familiar with, with the watchers as a, a group of celestial beings who have influenced humanity, some say for the good, some say not so good. But what I, we're going to look at today is how they've provided humanity with profound knowledge of spiritual technologies that enabled our ancients to communicate with God and also to affect the ultimate human transformation into celestial beings. The material that I'm going to be presenting in this quick hour today is drawn from my book, The Secret of Scion, from the Judgment Day Device, which is my investigation into the Ark of the Covenant and its role in current day prophecy, and also The Lost Secrets of the Watchers, Ascension, Resurrection, and Perfection, which is largely drawn from my research into the Dead Sea Scrolls and how the Essenes were interacting with these celestial beings and affecting this ultimate transformation. All of this material is available on, I have these handy flash drives with uh, about 14 hours of video and 18 books in PDF format. So if you wanna, if you're getting interested in this material during the talk, you can see me afterward. I'll be happy to uh, offer one of those to you as well. My investigation into this material actually began in 2008 with this painting. I was in Philadelphia in the Museum of Art. I was then researching my book, Freedom's Gate, which was about the ascension symbolism in the dome of the US Capitol. So I'm in Philadelphia researching the Founding Fathers, and I'm just absolutely, to borrow a phrase, gobsmacked by this painting. It stopped me in my tracks because I wondered why is Jesus shown as a winged angel? And who is this geezer, Francis of Assisi, that is staring up at this winged Christ angel? This painting, of course, is by John Van Eyck, the great mystic painter and, and alchemist. And it's, for some reason, it, it just mesmerized me, and it sent me off on a new path of research to understand why the resurrected Jesus is portrayed as a feathered Christ angel angel, speckled with white specks that were told by Van Eyck himself symbolize manna, the, the food of the gods, the food of the angels. And so this sent me on a quest to understand who these beings were. And it turns out that one of the most profound ascension appearances of Jesus took place in the 13th century in Italy, when he manifested before Francis of Assisi, one of the great esoteric researchers of all time and who now is considered to be a, the second Christ as a result of his encounter with Jesus as a seraphim, the highest order of angels. They're called the winged serpents. Quetzalcoatl, yes. We could be looking at the same variation of the same tribe of celestial beings. And during this encounter, Francis has beamed to him the wounds of the stigmata, the five wounds of the crucifixion. And afterwards, his biographers and his followers revere him as the second Christ. And in art throughout Renaissance Italy, we see these incredible depictions of Jesus as a seraph manifesting to Francis. This is Giotto's take on it. We see various other depictions throughout the uh, museums around the world. This one's from Harvard. We see uh, Jesus as this winged angel with the red wings in particular because the seraphim, we are told, burn with the love of the creator, hence their, their red wings. And the Catholic Church always warned that if you got too close to one of these celestial beings, you could be incinerated. But in the case of Francis of Assisi, it uplifted him, it transformed him. There was an energy transference that took place between this ascended being and this earthly being that resulted in the elevation of his consciousness and his transformation of his body itself into perhaps an, an ascended form, as we will see. This one happens to be in the National Gallery in, uh, here in London, it's by Sassetta. And you see Christ as a resurrected being, as an ascended being, portrayed as a winged angel, or by definition, a winged serpent or a seraph. Again, prompting us to think of Quetzalcoatl following on Hugh's presentation. After this experience, Francis, according to tradition, ascends. 
He, he then journeys into the celestial realms where now he takes his place at the throne of God and he dwells as the second Christ amidst the red-winged seraphs who are the guardians of the throne of Christ. Wherever that place is, as an interdimensional location or perhaps a, a, a spot in, the, in our own Milky Way galaxy, perhaps the galactic center as the Mormons believe. Either way, Francis has now elevated himself and dwells among these celestial beings. The seraphim appear throughout the art, beginning as, uh, even before the Renaissance, but especially in the Renaissance, portrayed as these feathered serpents, often, most often, this is how we identify them, with these sp spiral or vortex-shaped bodies. What these artists were trying to convey is this idea that these are otherworldly beings, celestial beings, that can be perceived by human eyes, but they are apparently very high vibrational beings, very fast moving beings that ordinarily are not perceived by the human eye. So the artist would always key on this idea that they're humanoid and that they have these whirling or twirling spinning bodies, vortex shaped bodies. This is in San Marco in Venice where we see the throne of Christ in the center. He's surrounded by the seraphim angels, again because they're the guardians of the throne. And we see Jesus enfolded within this gate filled with stars, hinting at the possibility that they're trying to convey some idea of travel to another dimension or perhaps he's in some, of a, some form of a gateway or perhaps a portal. These were huge ideas during the Renaissance. Pico della Mirandola said the highest human aspiration was to become a seraph and to uncover the secrets of the seraphim themselves, inferring that the foundational idea of the Renaissance was that they had recovered via the Corpus Hermeticum and other ancient texts, a method, an alchemy of human transf transformation or transmutation into a higher form that was originally delivered to humanity by the seraphim, who were also, of course, known as the Watcher Angels. I was in the Nubian Museum in Aswan a few years ago and stopped in my tracks by this fourth or 10th century, they, they're not sure which, but it's either fourth or 10th century image of Jesus as a seraph. So Francis's encounter with Jesus as a seraph was by no means isolated. There was a, a belief that Jesus himself in his resurrected form had taken on the celestial form of these angelic beings. And so here in the detail, we see him clearly portrayed with the six wings that identifies him as a seraph or a winged serpent. And what's fascinating is that during the time that Francis is having his encounter, we have all these tales throughout America of the pale one who manifested to the Native American tribes in a very similar form. And it makes me wonder if perhaps this was a part of a, a visitation, if you will, that was taking place during the 13th century, not just in Italy, but also in America, again, uh, the natives are chronicling this throughout North America. But it's the Essenes who are the primary drivers of our, of our research today into the, the Watchers and the Seraphim. They are the ones who took Enoch out of the Old Testament. Remember in the Old Testament we're told Enoch walked with God, inferring that as a living being he somehow transcended the earthly human condition and ascended into the heavens. The Old Testament leaves it at that. The Essenes pick him up and make a superhero out of him and begin to tell this story about how Enoch was taken into the heavens by the archangel Michael, one of the seraphim, anointed with an oil which dissolved Enoch's body into light so that he was a glorious being just like the other seraphim angels. After this experience, Enoch is given a new name, Metatron and membership among the seraphim angels. In fact, he becomes the guide for all humans who are on this path of ascension. So here's William Blake's uh, image of uh, Metatron at the throne of God, and you see the, the multiplicity of eyes indicating plural, a plurality of worlds as well as omniscience and, or omniscience and higher consciousness as well. And we start to introduce the, the symbol of the rainbow into our conversation as well. Beginning probably the eighth century or so in Byzantium, artists again have tried to convey this idea that there are otherworldly beings who are visiting Earth and they're called seraphim. And they, they're six winged and they have these vortex shaped bodies with, their, with feathers tinged in red, again, because they burn with the love of the creator. Sometimes they're portrayed as humanoid, but other times they're portrayed as 
without human faces because again, they're trying to convey this idea that these are otherworldly beings that take on human form or humanoid form, but they may in fact be energy beings, beings of pure light and indeed pure love. So beginning really in, in Byzantium and, and following on here into the Hagia Sophia, we start to see these incredible depictions of the seraphim here guarding the dome of the Hagia Sophia. This one, of course, you can see that it has the humanoid face with the six wings. But other examples that we see at the Hagia Sophia portray them as these non-humanoid beings. Again, conveying this idea that we're trying to visualize an otherworldly type of creature that is coming into our world. The burning ones, the winged serpents, the feathered serpents, these are all appellations that you'll see throughout history given to this class of beings that seem to have the ability to cross over space-time, open up portals and gateways, manifest in human form, then pop back into their ephemeral light being form at will. They're way beyond uh, our present day technology or, or maybe our, our understanding is just now coming into a view of the, of the potential enfolded within the human body that these beings were displaying. So here we are, we're looking at an example here of one of the seraph, it clearly is a humanoid form. You see the body covered with eyes, again, indicating omniscience and advanced uh, consciousness and perhaps even contact with other worlds. They have the ability to, to travel from Earth uh, th throughout the solar system and uh, even perhaps even between galaxies. In the Bible, they're considered great initiators of humanity. They're bringing spiritual knowledge in awareness of these other worlds and human potential. In this case, we have a, from the 12th century, uh, we see this seraph who's initiating Isaiah, who had an eyewitness encounter with one of these seraphs. We, we refer to them sometimes as the fallen ones. We, the, the watchers have a kind of a duality or duplicity about them. We're told clearly by the Essenes that they dwelled in the heavenly realms, but they crossed over a forbidden boundary. Before the time of the Essenes, this boundary was considered to be inviolate. Humans were not allowed to ascend, nor were beings allowed to come from the celestial realms to the earth plane without God's permission. But suddenly around 150 BC, the rule book is thrown out and we start to get these ideas that humans can take it upon themselves to ascend into the heavenly realms and then also we, we start to gain awareness that there were beings that left the throne of God, which is what we see up here, crossed over this forbidden barrier guard, guarded by the militia of God and took on human incarnation. These beings are now referred to as the fallen ones. And people throughout history have tried to, to tag them with the idea that because they're labeled the fallen ones, it means that they must somehow be evil or demonic. You, you could argue that, but you can also equally argue that that term fallen simply means they are no longer in their celestial flesh. Instead, they've taken on human incarnation. They've taken on human flesh. And the Dead Sea Scrolls make it absolutely explicitly clear that one of the missions that these beings came to Earth for was to teach humans how to transform out of their earthly flesh and return to our celestial flesh. So artists, especially beginning in the Renaissance, would convey this idea, again, of the throne up here atop in the celestial realms. We've got the throne that's inhabited by angels and just humans made perfect, according to the book of Hebrews. We have this banner of stars indicating we're crossing over the celestial realms and now they're falling. And as they're falling, they're moving away from their angelic form and they're taking on human form. And so technically the word fallen simply means they are now earthly human beings. They've taken on earthly incarnation but they brought with them the knowledge of how to cross over that forbidden boundary, and as the Dead Sea Scrolls describe, how to even knock holes in space-time, open portals or gateways, and ascend into the celestial realms. So a little selection here of some of the art portraying the, the fallen ones, the, the seraphim, descending from the celestial realms, the realm of light and love, and then taking on human incarnation, leaving behind, presumably, a place that we all have come from originally and seek to return to. So then when you get into the Judeo-Christian tradition, these feathered serpents, winged serpents, burning ones are, are portrayed as great guardians of humanity, initiators. Some people believe they also led us astray. That's the Catholic Church's position, certainly. And so here in this example, we see Adam and Eve being escorted from the gate of Eden 
by a red-winged seraph. And of course, you remember that this is the moment when God built a gate at the east of Eden, put a flashing flaming sword in the center of that gate, and forbade humanity to return. He also made for us coats of skin, we're told. The Old Testament God made coats of skin for Adam and Eve, and the idea is that in esoteric Judaism, those coats of skin were not animal skin, they are these skins, suggesting, as they tell us in these texts, that humans originally were like the angels. That is a foundational belief to the Essenes, that humans originally were like these beings, then after our, our eviction from Eden, we're now trapped in our flesh bodies, our human flesh bodies, and our goal is to return to our celestial flesh bodies. So in this example from the Limborg brothers, we see Eve receiving the wisdom from the, the serpent that's making its way up the, the pillar here. It's a feminine serpent, interestingly. And then we see Adam and Eve being escorted from Eden by a red-winged seraph. Again, suggesting that they are not only our initiators, but had something perhaps to do with the fall. This example is from Salisbury. Many of you have probably been there and seen this. It's a fantastic example from the 18th century where we see the seraph in its golden feathered cloak or cape initiating Isaiah. This example was very intriguing to me in particular because of, it reminded me so much of what we see of uh, the way Ptah is portrayed in ancient Egypt. Ptah is the creator god. He fashioned the human body according to the ancient Egyptians. He was also the god of technology, if you will. He holds in his hand a resurrection stick that can open the gates of heaven. And so I wonder, uh, just apart from the visual similarity, is there a possibility that somehow Ptah could play into this scenario? And I think, uh, I think there is, and we'll, we'll see how that works here in just a moment. But in the Harris Papyrus, for example, in the British Museum, you see Ptah with his feathered cloak, his many-colored feathered cloak. He's got rainbow rings around his chest. He wears his uh, skull cap of, of enlightenment, and he holds the resurrection stick that opens the gates of heaven and the, the realm or field or dimension of the blessed. These are very key symbols for us as we continue in our conversation because it establishes that going back to at least 1500 BC, perhaps longer, there was knowledge of esoteric technology that was brought to earth by the gods, by the angels, especially this garment of many colors and the resurrection stick and this helmet of salvation, as it's called. These might be actual technologies, and it's it's possible that they are, but they're also symbols of psycho-spiritual attributes within us. And this is what we see the ancient Egyptians obsessed with, is how to activate the latent capabilities of our consciousness, to open up our, our uh, expand our, our, our brain capacity, to expand the abilities of, of the human body, and ultimately to wear the cloak or garment of light, the garment of many colors, just like the gods wore. So very key symbolism for us. And we see the symbolism appearing in the imagery of the, of the seraphim. This is an Annunciation scene where we see the Archangel Gabriel, one of the seraphim, manifesting to Mary, the Virgin Mary. Gabriel has the, the resurrection stick in his hand. He wears the garment of many colors. And he also wears a, a, a jeweled diadem that indicates his expanded or open crown chakra. And here, Gabriel, of course, is, is coming before Mary to tell her that she is going to be the Theotokos, or the, the, the bearer of the divine Christ child. It's interesting here that uh, Roger van der Baden puts a, a red-winged seraph on the cloak of Gabriel to reinforce this idea that this is one of the winged serpents that is manifested before Mary and is, uh, has come to Earth in order to take part in what we would today describe as some sort of a genetics alteration just like Ptah is credited with in ancient Egypt. So very interesting correspondence there between Gabriel and Ptah in terms of the symbolism. This is Bartel Bruin's take on the same, same scenario where Gabriel is wearing this many colored garment, this feathered cloak, holds the resurrection stick, which is actually a caduceus, which is in fact the symbol of the seraphim, of the winged serpents. And Gabriel is portrayed use, using that stick, that holy stick, to conduct the, the soul of Jesus, which is descending on this light beam, carrying the cross, 
along with the, the dub of the Holy Spirit, this higher vibrational energy that will infuse Mary's body and fulfill the Essenes' ambition to manifest a new human being. The Essenes, again, were the, they who primarily developed the idea of the seraphim as our benefactors, and they also developed the belief that the human body can be transformed or turned into a vessel capable of holding a higher dimensional spiritual energy and thereby introduce a new version of humanity that is closer to the angels. And so that's actually what's going on in these, in these scenes here. Again, Gabriel with the resurrection stick, the serpent rouge, and conducting the, the dub of the Holy Spirit, the higher vibrational energy into the body of Mary. She is prepared for this experience, just like many other of the Essene women were. And this is a mental, physical, spiritual, and emotional transformation that she's undergone preparatory to receiving this light or vibration. The seraphim, of course, are the, the angels, the watcher angels that were present on Easter morning. They are the men in white who were in the tomb of resurrection on Easter. And we're told in various accounts, uh, for example here, coming from the, the Gospel of Luke, that an angel of the Lord came down from heaven at this moment. In another example, we're, we're told that this being that manifested had an appearance like lightning and clothes as white as snow and brought a message to the, the female disciples who were present at that moment not to be afraid. That is one of the prime messages of the watcher angels and the seraphim, to rise, to elevate ourselves, and to not be afraid. But this takes us into a really important direction in terms of our conversation about the seraphim, these watcher angels, because we start to learn that they are lightning-like. Lightning, of course, is plasma, and that's what our sun is made of. So when the ancients are telling us that they're light beings, we now understand that they are actually plasma beings. In fact, in the Jewish mystical book, the Hekelat Zutardi, we learned that their walking is like the appearance of lightning, a lightning bolt, plasma. A vision of them is like a vision of a rainbow. Their faces are like the vision of a bride, and their wings are like the radiance of the clouds of glory. So these beings are lightning-like, they're rainbow-hued, perhaps, and they're radiant, meaning they're luminous, and they're glorious beings, meaning they glow rays. So we're going to put this cheesy plasma ball on here, and it's going to tip our imagination to recognize that what these ancient artists are trying to convey with these feathers is not necessarily that they're wearing feathered cloaks, but their bodies are feather-like because they're luminous plasma-like beings that can take on physical incarnation that reminds these artists that, that of what we think of as bird feathers. So in my opinion, we're clearly describing energetic beings, plasma beings, lightning-like beings that take on this, this physical human resemblance. The Dead Sea Scrolls, the Essenes tell us that these holy angels, the holy angels of the Lord as they call them, come and go from the celestial realms to the earth realm through these whirling wheels, these red-winged wheels called Ophanum. And they, when they manifest between these whirling wheels, they're like a fiery vision of most holy spirits, and around them stream rivulets of molten fire, again suggesting plasma, like incandescent bronze, a radiance of many brilliant colors of exquisite hues gloriously mingled. So this is a human who's having a physical uh, encounter with one of these beings and trying to describe them as, as lightning-like beings, but also giving off many colored hues. And this is, I think, gonna take us to the idea of where this many colored garment idea came from. These beings are radiating rainbow colored light is what we surmise from these eyewitness descriptions. Around them stream rivulets of molten fire like incandescent bronze, a radiance of many brilliant colors of exquisite hues gloriously mingled. So bearing the, that description in mind, and the, the, the description that they come to Earth through these winged wheels, we're fully developing the idea that these are beings that come from other realms that manifest on Earth through some form of perhaps technology, the winged wheels. And when they manifest, they, they take on a physicality that can be described. And in Jewish mysticism, the best I can tell you is that the complete physical characteristics of these watcher beings includes a humanoid body, a serpentine face, a many-colored garment 
They rise up in the air like whirlwinds. They're luminous or radiant. They have feathered cloaks or capes, many eyes, and they can fluidly morph or change form and shape shift. All of the references behind these descriptions are mostly from the Dead Sea Scrolls, and they're in my books. We don't have time to get into it today, but trust me, this is what they say about these beings. And finally, around them stream these rivulets of molten fire, a radiance of many brilliant colors of exquisite hues gloriously mingled. So this is what we're dealing with from these eyewitness accounts of these beings. And the thing about it is, is that when we get into this, we start to realize that this is a class of beings that are described not just in Judeo-Christian tradition or by the Essenes, and here's my cheesy rainbow I'm putting over them to tip the idea that they're rainbow-like beings, but we also find them in other traditions as well. Another example before we go forward is John the Revelator, who is visited, visited by an angel who came down out of heaven, suggesting he came through some form of a portal or a gateway, who is clothed with a cloud and with a rainbow around his head, who gave John a book to eat that tasted like honey. So this is clearly one of these seraphim beings, these watcher angels that, is, that have manifested. And according to the Essenes in the Dead Sea Scrolls, this book contained a teaching that they referred to in the Dead Sea Scrolls as the perfect way, the perfection of holiness, perfect holiness, or walking in the way of perfection. And it was given to the Essenes by these otherworldly beings who they said in the scrolls were living with them at Qumran and Mount Carmel and other Essene uh, outposts. And they referred to them as the heavenly holy ones, the sons of heaven, holy angels of the Lord, or the perfect ones. These angels delivered to the Essenes the heavenly secret or mystery that resulted in the transformation of their body into a supernatural substance or celestial flesh. And this is one reason I believe why the traditional church has demonized these beings, because you can't have a multitude of humans out there turning themselves from earthly flesh into celestial flesh. They're unmanageable and they don't pay taxes. <laughs> so we gotta control them. <laughs> the Essenes sought this bodily and spiritual perfection in order to transform the earth into a place of light and love, but also to cross over the boundary between earth and heaven. The Bible even says that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven, suggesting a transformation is required preparatory to doing this. And this is what the Essenes said these beings came to teach them, is how to cross that boundary and enter and dwell in a celestial city the New Jerusalem or Sion that they suggested is hovering above the earth. And then they would dwell with these angels in the perfect light for all eternity. Now, the thing about this is, is that when you go to Tibet, you learn of what's called the great perfection tradition. And in this tradition, the Tibetans teach that the human body was designed to be transformed into a being of light. Specifically, our body can be spun twirled into a vortex so its frequency is accelerated until it dissolves into five colored rainbow light leaving behind only hair, toe, and fingernails which have no nerves to be transmuted. That's the Tibetan great perfection tradition. And how many times in the past three minutes have I said the word perfect relative to the Essenes? And this description that they were trying to attain a perfect body. I believe that what they're describing here is their transformation into the rainbow body of light of Tibetan Buddhism. And in this tradition, the, the Essenes tell, excuse me, the Tibetans tell us that this teaching did not come from Earth. It is a celestial teaching that they said is taught in 13 star systems, including our own. And when we look at these, these images of Tonkas, these are from the, the, the Wind Horse Gallery here in London, which gifted these to me several years ago, we see some key symbols. We see Padmasambhava, who is the guru who's being portrayed here, sitting on a lotus throne. He holds a resurrection stick in his hand. He holds or wears the crown of glory. He holds in his hand the Vajra, which is a thunderbolt, which the Tibetans teach is the key of life, to, sorry about that, the, the key of life to, to the Tibetans, which is compassion in action. And he's also radiating golden rays. 
This is the next spiritual evolution of humanity according to, to the Tibetans, and I believe this is what the Essenes were trying to tell us, the celestial beings, the seraphim, were teaching them. Now, as best as I can figure, the, the star systems in which this teaching is taught includes our star system, Sol, but it also includes Sirius, Orion, the Pleiades, Cygnus, Lyra, Vega, Arcturus, and Ursa Major. These are the star systems you see mentioned over and over again in myth and scripture throughout the past several thousand years. And many of these traditions describe beings coming and going from these star systems. And I propose that in part what the Tibetans are telling us is that these celestial beings came from this, this network of star systems in order to teach humanity how to raise ourselves into an ascended being just like the seraphim. Something that's unique in my work is that the Tibetan rainbow body and the body of the seraphim are the same thing. That's just what these artists are trying to convey, and this is why Van Eyck has Jesus in a rainbow-colored feathered garment, a many-colored garment, because he's not describing him as a being with feathers. He's describing him as an energetic being that's manifesting, and the energy coming from his body appears like feathers to the human eye. So the Tibetans don't say this, and the Jews don't say that, and the Christians don't say that, but I say that, and I'm asking you to follow me in that connection. And I'm not uh, stating that out of ego, but just to say that this is something new that we're trying to, to break ground on here. So what I'm suggesting is that the seraphim, these beings of celestial flesh, are in fact rainbow body beings. Every bit of the description of the watcher angels as portrayed in the ancient text is seen in these images of the Tibetan rainbow body, including the serpentine face, the many colored garment, and other attributes. Ptah also exemplifies this set of symbolism as well. He stands here in this image from the tomb of Nefertari before a rainbow colored stairway to heaven, the Tet pillar, the, the, the symbol of resurrection to the ancient Egyptians. He wears his tight-fitting crossed garment, as Gerald Massey poetically referred to it. He holds his resurrection stick. He's got the rainbow rings around his, his neck, and he also wears his crown of wisdom, or crown of salvation. Yeah, it could just be pure entertainment that they happen to be carrying exactly the same symbols and have exactly the same meaning. Ptah is an ascended being. He is a, a god of resurrection. And is it possible that he actually, when he fashioned the human body, he tweaked our DNA in order for us as humans to become like the gods or like the angels? Is this how we account for the similarity in the symbolism and in the portrayal of these beings? Ptah, of course, we know is connected with the star system Sirius, which is one of the, the star systems we talked about a moment ago as part of the network of these uh, ancient star systems that have this, that are, uh, where this teaching is taught. We can go to Osiris on his feathered ascension throne, wearing his, again, the crossed garment, the, the bright white garment of light. And by the way, what happens when you spin all the colors of the rainbow together? They form white, right? And so maybe this is a, a re another reason why Osiris wears this bright white garment. He's also got the rainbow necklace, and look at his Atef crown, the symbolism of the crown. Isn't it interesting, to say the least, that it, it, it matches very closely the energetic pattern of what we see in the Tibetan tankas of the rainbow body beings? Is Osiris, in his resurrection, a rainbow body being? We can't answer that definitively, but we can follow that trail and see that perhaps the ancient <laughs> Egyptians in their descriptions in the pyramid texts and elsewhere are describing human transformation into lightning-like celestial beings. And what they meant by that is the same thing the Tibetans mean when they describe the human transformation into rainbow body beings. And that is the same thing that the Essenes mean when they talk about humans becoming perfect humans. Again, the, the rainbow body teaching in Tibet is referred to as the great perfection. And in his resurrected name, Osiris took on the name Wenenefer, the one who continues to be perfect. So that word perfect for me is sort of like a, it's a golden needle I use to thread my way through various ancient traditions. And it may be that it's just a, a linguistic connection that, that isn't actually valid, but in my opinion, I think you can, we're making a very strong case here that we're dealing with 
extraterrestrial beings who came here to deliver to humanity a teaching about how we transform and then journey into the stars. And that word perfect or perfection is our key word that certainly resonates throughout time, but I also propose connects all these various resurrection teachings throughout time. Moses had an encounter in the book of Exodus with that famous burning bush when an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. What if he also encountered one of these rainbow body beings? Does this explain why Moses, after this experience, shone like the sun? Is it possible that Moses learned how to affect this transformation and began to demonstrate to the Israelites how humans can turn into the shining ones, literally beings of light and love, just like the seraphim and the rainbow body beings? To me, uh, the most important part of my research in connecting these various traditions, the Judeo-Christian, the Tibetan, the Egyptian, and others, has to do with this description in the New Testament. The New Testament says that the watchers are the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their original habitation in the celestial realms at God's throne and are now being bound by everlasting chains of darkness awaiting the great day of judgment. Now, what's important here is that this Greek word that's translated first estate is okiterion, which according to Strong's Bible Dictionary speaks to a dwelling place or a habitation of the body as a dwelling place for the spirit. It's an abode for the soul. And the fact is, is that that word, okiteron, is used only one other time in the New Testament. It not only describes the original body of the seraphim angels, the angels of the Lord, but specifically, that word is used in one other place in 2 Corinthians to refer to the resurrection body or eternal spiritual light body of Christ. What that means is that the resurrection body of Christ and the body of the seraphim are the same thing. That when the angels, the celestial beings, the seraphim lived in heaven, they have the exact same body that Christ attained in his resurrection. And that was the whole mission of why these seraphim came to dwell with the Essenes was to teach humanity how to become seraphim-like. So in Christian art, when you see the resurrection of Christ taking place, you see him bursting out of the tomb in a radiant orb of light, surrounded very often by seraphim, by the winged serpents, because he is attaining the same celestial flesh that they possessed. And so in example after example in Christian art, we will see the resurrection where they are trying to convey this idea that he is no longer in his earthly flesh, but he is in some sort of an energetic light body. And now we know that that light body is the same as the body of the seraphim. And this to me is a mission accomplished for them. They came and they taught at least one human how to affect this transformation. And in Christian art, when you see the resurrected Jesus, he is very often in a body surrounded by <laughs> rainbow-colored light, a multi-hued body. This is the many-colored garment that we've been trying to attain for so long. And even in the Gnostic Gospel of Philip, we are told we must become perfect before leaving this world. Now, in this case, perfect can mean become whole, holy, complete, or compassionate. But if we follow uh, my path, then what it's saying is that we must attain our rainbow body of light before leaving this world. In order to leave the third rock from the sun, according to the Dalai Lama, who understands this tradition and teaches it, we have to transform our body into celestial flesh that matches that of the seraphim angels, of the watchers. And this is the spiritual technology I'm referring to that they brought to earth. And if I'm correct in some of my assessments here, going back to ancient Egypt with Ptah, he came here from Sirius to tweak human DNA so that we can affect this transformation or this perfection of our body. And the Essenes are examples, examples, the resurrection of Jesus is an example. And what they're all trying to convey is that within us, this isn't something we go get. This is something that is already within us, it's something we reveal. We all have within us this glorious, many-colored garment of light that is covered up by our human skin. 
And this is a return to our original form. And in fact, uh, Christian prophecy says that at the time of the, the judgment day, whenever that is, we will be changed by a sound wave. A last trump or trumpet will sound and the dead, us, will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. We shall be, in fact, exactly like the resurrected Christ. But if you don't like to follow the Christian tradition, then what they're saying is that we will be exactly like the angels, the seraphim, the watchers, and we will also be just like Padmasambhava and other Tibetans who have attained the rainbow body of light. That is our, our goal right there, according to all of these spiritual traditions. Here's uh, Hans Memling's take on this of John the Revelator, seeing the rainbow bridge open. We see him peering into the celestial scion. It's inhabited by various figures here who are all playing musical instruments, which makes me very happy because I get to take my guitars with me, hopefully. And we see Jesus on the rainbow throne, holding in his hand the resurrection stick, the ascension crown, and other accoutrements, including the breastplate of righteousness. I don't think it's any coincidence that he holds all of these particular symbols because as we have tracked, this comes from Tibet. But originally it didn't come from Tibet, it might have originated with Ptah in Egypt. If you don't like that, then let's just leave the planet and let's go find another star system where they're teaching exactly the same thing. But the point is, over a period of at least 3,000 years, we see this idea being conveyed that humans can transform into celestial beings, and there appears to be some form of spiritual technology involved that is symbolized by a resurrection stick, a crown, a breastplate of righteousness, and other tools or implements as well. But again, the point is, is that this is exactly what we see demonstrated in Christian art, is this belief that we all can transform into these celestial beings. And I realize I've shown a lot of examples of males. Here's a female, this is Mary, wearing her many colored cloak or garment. And in Hans Memling's depiction, she's got the star on her robe, indicating the star cloak, and she wears the plasma crown, indicating that she too has attained this elevated state of consciousness the, the, as, a, as a plasma being, as a, as a star being. So what I'm saying to you is that the seraphim the body of the seraphim, the body of the rainbow body beings, and the resurrection body of Jesus are the exact same thing. And this is a, a universal, perhaps, teaching, certainly isolated to the, the 13 local star systems, but I believe it would continue out into the cosmos, if truth be told. Let's uh, visit the Temple of Hathor at Dendera. Many of you have probably been there? Yeah. So you go to the, the Temple of Hathor, the Temple of Love and Joy, built uh, by the Ptolemies around 300 BC, brand new at the time of Jesus and Mary Magdalene. When you go inside the, the Temple of Hathor, you are treated to a magnificent ceiling where we see the, what's known as the astronomical ceiling. And most notably, what we see are the gods, actually the Ptolemies, humans, who have transformed into celestial beings and they now ride upon what the ancient Egyptians called the Ark of the Millions of Years or the Celestial Ship. The Ark of the Millions of Years, the Celestial Ship, different names for it. We notice that the Ptolemaic king holds the resurrection stick in his hand. Schwaller de Lubitz thought that this was a conductor of some kind of a higher vibrational spiritual energy perhaps drawn from Sirius. But in my sort of Robert Baval and the Great Pyramid moment, I'm laying on my back in this temple and I notice that the way the ancient Egyptians portrayed the Ark of the Millions of Years looks exactly like the way modern science portrays a wormhole. And at first, the guides in Egypt used to laugh at me about that. And now I go into the Temple of Hathor and I hear the, overhear the guides saying, yeah, there's the Ptolemaic king on his wormhole traveling as an ascended being <laughs> for eternity. And I believe that it's not a coincidence once again, that, that perhaps what the ancient Egyptians are conveying, that this is a transformed human who is traveling the stars in what they call the arc of the millions of years, we today call a wormhole. And what they are fundamentally describing here is this transformation of how we become these celestial beings. We know, of course, the ancient Egyptians tell us that as the god of technology, it was Ptah who crafted not only the human body, but he also crafted pun intended, the craft of the gods, the ship of eternity. 
So when I put those pieces together, it sounds like to me like he, again, did something, tweaked our DNA to make it a more conducive vehicle to ride the wormholes of heaven, to, to actually sit on the ascension throne, the feathered ascension throne, which is what we see here, to hold the key of life, to hold the resurrection stick, to wear the crown of salvation, and to travel the stars as a celestial being. This is the kit of resurrection symbols portrayed, once again, by the Egyptians. Now, you're probably sitting in your seat and you've already realized that this crown, the feathered ascension throne, the lotus craft, the resurrection stick, and the key of life is exactly what we saw in an earlier depiction of Padmasambhava. It's the exact same symbolism with the same concept. A human is transformed into, into a celestial being and now sits on the lotus throne, holds the resurrection stick, wears the crown of glory, holds the vajra or key of life, and radiates golden rays or rivulets of gold as they were described by the Jews. And now we have him even enfolded within a gateway because the belief is that once we open our rainbow body, we're then able to open gateways into these other star systems. So what I've done is to say, I believe that the Ptolemaic king at, at Dendera and Padmasambhava are interchangeable symbolically. They're both telling exactly the same story. And they're probably both drawing from the original celestial sources, whether it's Ptah from Sirius or somebody from Cygnus or some other uh, star realm. They're coming here and implanting into human consciousness these ideas. And this is what I pursue when, when we're in Egypt and certainly would invite you to, to join us on one of these expeditions into the Stargate symbolism of the ancients. This is a, a favorite image from Tibet of the uh, rainbow body. I call him the celestial dancer because uh, he's enfolded within this spinning rainbow ring of, of energy. As we get closer, we see he's got his garment of light on. And this is another way that the Tibetans would portray these rainbow body beings, this kind of blur of energy. They're humanoid, but what we're trying to describe here are otherworldly beings coming into our world or perhaps even our dimension. I was on a cruise ship in Luxor one night and watched a mystic Islamic dance, a whirling dervish dance. And the dancer uh, starts out spinning in place. Before I know it, he's got what's called a Merkaba vehicle spinning around his body. And the idea is that he's trying to connect himself or tell the story of the connection between heaven and earth. And I'm looking at that going, that looks like a UFO. This, this looks like the story of Elijah who ascended into the heavens in a whirlwind or Enoch who ascended or any of the other figures who ascended into the heavens. He's clearly transforming his body into something else. And then he started spinning his second skirt. And the, the cracking sound on the floor was my jaw shattering <laughs> because here's this dancer in this 800 year old mystic Islamic dance turning his body into the shape of a wormhole. So I, of course, called this the wormhole dance. And right away recognized that this is conveying this idea of human transformation into a being capable of opening a portal or a gateway. So does an 800-year-old mystic Islamic dance encode the ultimate secrets of modern physics? I believe that it does. And by studying this ancient art, we learn about the ultimate capability of, of human DNA and what is enfolded within all of us. At the end of his dance, he collapses his second skirt into a bundle and his assistant brings him a linen shroud which he wraps the, the bundle with and then feeds it milk. The idea here is, is what? How did you get here? Before you took on one of these things, where were you in the cosmos? And after you leave here, where are you going? We have health plans, career plans, we have uh, pension plans. What's your ascension plan? <laughs> right? Where are we going to go after this and how are we going to get there? This is what these ancients are trying to answer. And it also says to me that as we embrace this, this idea of this expansive cosmos, it, it opens our consciousness and will lead to the birth of a new human who is less concerned about earthly affairs and more interested in how we connect ourselves with the cosmos, which is what all these ancient sites we study are about, right? How do we make this connection between the earthly 
and the heavenly, whether it's the old mechs, Stonehenge, the pyramids, wherever, that is the fundamental question enfolded or encoded within all of those ancient monuments. But the basic idea here is that our human body can be spun or accelerated into a vortex or, okay, a flying saucer of energy that ultimately manifests as five colored rainbow light. Even the colors are the same. And these are traditional colors that this mystic Islamic dancer is, is displaying here. Even the colors are the same. This new body is called the rainbow body of light or the glory body, and it resembles a misty or luminous cloud, which is why you see Jesus flying around on a cloud in second coming imagery and why he's in the ring, because it suggests or tells us that he has attained this higher level of awareness. So I connect the Tibetan Lama in the rainbow ring with Jesus and also the ancient Sumerian depictions of the Anunnaki in their winged rings. Those are probably not hardware flying saucers, although they could be. More than likely, we are dealing with higher consciousness beings who have manifested a, a more vibrant or light body. And as I discussed in my book, The Judgment Day Device, these beings, the seraphim, are type three or type four beings on the Kardashev scale. They have the ability to travel throughout the, the galaxy. They can open gateways, portals. They can manifest human bodies. They can do all kinds of incredible things. You might ask, have I ever encountered a seraph? And I, I have a tentative yes answer. I was in, uh, sorry about that, I don't know what that was. I was at James Gilliland's ranch in uh, upstate in Washington, in, in, in the northwest of the US, and I gave a talk about the seraphim, and afterwards James comes up and he says, uh, yeah, tonight at nine o'clock we're gonna open a portal and invite some seraphim in. And everybody just kind of laughed, including me. It's like, what are you talking about? So sure enough, after that get together, we all walk outside of this building. There was probably 300 people there, and I'm standing there with a group of about 20 people, and I look up into the sky, and here comes this bright orange orb of light. And it's silently floating. And I, there's no noise, it's not a helicopter, it's not a plane, you kind of go through the checklist. Somebody had the presence of mind to pull out a, a cell phone camera and they took this video. And while you can't see exactly what we saw, I want you to just kind of judge what we experienced by the reaction of the crowd. There it is right there. <laughs> yeah. You get the idea. Pure joy. Pure joy. Exuberance. But closer to home, let's go to Hatfield House. And let's look at one of the famous, most famous portraits in British history, the rainbow portrait of Queen Elizabeth I. Why, of all things, did Dr. John Dee choose this symbolism to portray Elizabeth? Why is she covered with eyes? Why does she have a feathered serpent on her arm? Why does she hold a rainbow? The reason is, in my opinion, is because she is being portrayed not as just the fairy queen, Gloriana, and the belief was, of course, that Elizabeth was a star child who took on human incarnation, but because John Dee wanted you to believe that Elizabeth was, in fact, a seraph. Now, whether you believe that or not, it's up to you. But the fact of the matter is, is that symbolism is there, and John Dee said that this image, this painting, was an icon that was meant to draw down spiritual power to ensure the prosperity of Great Britain during her reign and thereafter. So isn't it interesting that this this body of symbolism should appear in this really powerful and important painting. Moses, as I said earlier, had an encounter with what I believe is a seraphim twice, not just the burning bush, but he also lifted the serpent of healing in the wilderness. It's called the Nehushtan. That is the logo of the seraphim. And what happened in this episode is that Moses lifts the serpent, the Nehushtan, and by virtue of doing so, I propose a seraph actually manifest, manifested to the Israelites as a rainbow body being. Jesus directly referred to that incident when he talked about the secret of eternal life, 
when he said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believeth in him should not perish, but will have eternal life. I think Jesus is referring to the spiritual technology of the seraphim and telling us that if we want to attain our light body and eternal life, to learn the symbolism of the Nehushtan. And this is exactly what we see once again at Dendera, where we see a being lifting up a tube that is curiously similar to, if not identical to, what we today call a plasma tube. And we see that there is a serpent that is within this tube. So symbolically speaking, what we're looking at here is someone lifting or holding a serpent. By definition, in Israelite symbolism, that is a Nehushtan that is being lifted up in the crypt at Dendera. And it could well be that it's, in fact, a plasma being that's holding it. But another image uh, that we want to draw our attention to comes from Abydos in Egypt, where we see the same serpent lifted up now on this pillar. When we take this imagery here, and you can see the, that this serpent lifted on a pole is identical to this serpent on a pole, we're, when we connect these images, we're led to a very, very provocative place. This right here is part of the hieroglyph for the head of Osiris, the Egyptian god of resurrection. It's actually the Egyptian symbol for the hope for the afterlife. And when you assemble all of these symbols here, you get this complete device, which is in the Osiris Chapel at Abydos. It's referred to as the ladder or stairway to heaven. And again, it's the symbol of Osiris. It's the head of Osiris, and it looks to a modern eye like it's quite mechanical looking, like this is some kind of machine, perhaps. Some of you are probably looking at this right now and saying that the base or platform that this thing sits on, that this pillar, the head of Osiris, sits on, bears a striking resemblance to what we think of as the Ark of the Covenant. And I think you would be very correct in that assessment. It was, of course, the Ark of the Covenant was the device, sign, seal, or symbol upon which the Israelite God Yahweh manifested as a luminous humanoid figure with a rainbow aura. You see where I'm going with this? That perhaps what we're talking about here with the Ark of the Covenant and with the Osiris device, as I referred to it, is the technology of the seraphim, which is why they're portrayed guarding the Ark of the Covenant. It's their device. It is their sign, seal, symbol, tool, or appliance that is used ultimately, I believe, and proposed to transform the human body into another form. And so when we go to Egypt, what we're actually seeing here with the Osiris device, which again I'm suggesting was brought here or belonged to the seraphim, is actually the fully constructed Ark of the Covenant. When you compare these two images, you see that the two tablets of the law are the two ostrich feathers or tablets on top of the ark. The rod of Aaron, whose name means enlightenment, is this rod right here. And the ark platform is obviously the same, or the ark box is obviously the same as this platform upon which the, the head of Osiris is, is screwed in. So I believe and propose that what we see here is actually a spiritual technology brought to earth by the seraphim that the Egyptians knew of as the head of Osiris, or the ultimate symbol for the hope for the afterlife. So here we see a traditional image of Israelites carrying the Ark of the Covenant, the feathered Ark, and we see it beside the fully assembled Osiris device here. But in fact, what we're looking at here is not the Osiris device from Abydos. It's the same symbolism but what we're looking at here with this feathered platform, this garment of light, this book, and this cross attached to it, is known to Christianity as the Edomatia, or the throne of Christ. This is the sign, symbol, or seal of the resurrected Christ. And it's exactly the same thing as the head of Osiris, symbolically speaking. Again, brought here by the seraphim. Which is why, in Christian second coming, Art, you see Jesus in a orb of light up here with his ophanum wheels and his symbol right beside him. It's because it's his property. It's his sign, seal, or symbol. And not only do you see Jesus in his ascended form beside this device, but you see that it's also guarded by the seraphim because it's their device too. Refer to it as a resurrection machine, if you like, there's lots of different ways we can go with this. We've only got a couple minutes left, and I just wanted to leave you with this, this parting thought. 
that this is the sign or symbol or spiritual technology of the seraphim brought from another world that manifested in ancient Egypt, it manifests in Christianity as the symbol for Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, and ultimately, it all tells us the same story. These angels, who are here, again, beside the fully assembled Ark of the Covenant, are the seraphim. And their spiritual technology is designed to transform humans into rainbow-like beings who can then travel into the cosmos. Now, one parting thought I'm going to leave you with, because some of you are probably going, who cares? I don't believe in Christianity anyway, and a lot of this stuff is just a bunch of garbage, blah, blah, blah. Well, let's finish with a thought here from, we'll just cruise through these images here of the fully assembled Ark of the Covenant and the, the throne of Christ, actually. And let's, let's finish here with what's happened recently. You might have heard of the WikiLeaks leaks that happened just a, a few weeks ago. John Podesta at that time was Hillary Clinton's chief of staff. He's a major proponent of UFO disclosure and has said publicly that one of his greatest failures when he worked for President Obama was that he, they did not disclose you, the existence of aliens and UFOs publicly. There was a, the WikiLeaks dump that revealed conversations that John Podesta had with Dr. Edgar Mitchell, the sixth man to walk on the moon. And they had conversations about the existence of aliens, alien technology, and space warfare. One uh, missive opens with an urgent request by Dr. Mitchell to discuss zero-point energy, a free energy device, and disclosure. Mitchell claimed that he was working with higher dimensional extraterrestrial beings from a contiguous universe, as he described it, who wished to give humanity a zero-point device that would solve all of our energy problems and presumably, at least according to the belief of Dr. Mitchell, lead to the transformation of humanity into a, a, a peaceful race that ultimately then can journey into the stars. That was his hope. Call him crazy, but that was his hope. And he was working at the highest levels of the US government to disclose the existence of these beings and the existence of their technology. What I propose to you is that what Dr. Mitchell was actually describing when he's envisioning what he described extraterrestrial intelligences from a, from a contiguous universe, and he goes on to say that these beings work directly with God and are directly obedient to God, there is only one class of extraterrestrial beings that I know of that are in the human record and have been there for several thousand years. The beings that Dr. Mitchell, and here are some of these uh, WikiLeaks uh, emails, that, that spell this out. The beings that I believe that Dr. Mitchell was trying to get Podesta and the US government to acknowledge the existence of are the seraphim. They are directly obedient to God, they come from the throne of God, and as we have just demonstrated, they also sought to bring to humankind a device, a spiritual technology about human transformation into celestial beings that could even be a free energy device. So thank you very much for your, your kind attention. Thank you, Andrew, for, for having me here. It's a pleasure. Brilliant. Thanks. 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 Yeah. Thank you, everybody.